I ask every year, you know, who do you see as the top threats to the banking industry? And this year was big tech, big banks, and fit large fintech. And uh, about four out of 10 bank CEOs said they saw the government. So it's it's the regulatory environment that's really kind of popping in a, as a threat to the, the banking industry. Uh, I mean, the administration, the, a, a lot of senators, it's clearly very negative from a regulatory perspective towards banks. You know, we've got the Credit Card Competition Act sitting out there that's going to slash interchange rates and, and income. Yeah, you've got an environment that is uh, not very friendly towards a lot of large mergers, uh, but clearly they are trying to engineer a more, quote, competitive environment. And I think most bankers look at it and go, man, it's pretty damn competitive already. Everybody, uh, greetings. Uh, I'm in Dubai today, and my very good friend Ron Shevlin, uh, who is a consultant with uh, Cornerstone Advisors. Uh, Ron has been uh, for a couple of years now uh, my go-to person uh, to understand uh, what's um, you know going on on the ground in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. banking system, uh, in uh, on the innovation front, uh, how the banks are lining up against you know players like apple and, and so on so i want to make this uh, a, a continuing conversation with ron uh, i actually have this conversation with him every time i you know go past uh, boston we have lunch and we exchange notes and and uh, i thought that we should put this on video so that um, you know all of uh, my uh, followers and and those of asian banker can uh, benefit from so ron thanks for doing this with me uh, anytime, Emmanuel. Always happy to chat with you. So let me not, um, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, color the uh, the slate in, in terms of uh, what you see. Uh, what I saw in the last um, in, in the last quarter, at least, uh, were dismal results uh, of the U.S. mainstream banks uh, and the ongoing uh, episode of the relationship between the banks and the. Uh, um, you know, the technology platforms, so namely uh, Apple, but I'm sure all the, all the rest of them. So maybe we should start with these two, unless you have something in the back of your mind that you think people should know uh, about uh, innovation and finance in the U.S. right now. So, Emmanuel, I don't know if you can really tell because the windows behind me tend to let, let, let the glare in, but it's a pretty cloudy day here in the Boston area. And I think that's really captures the whole mood of the banking industry in the US. It's it's cloudy. Um, I would characterize the pace of innovation here as uh, w one of two analogies, either uh, they're pumping the brakes uh, or they're hitting some speed bumps. Uh, and clearly it's because of the economic situation and your comments about the results uh, from the Q4 are not particularly great. And um, that has a lot to do with declining loan uh, loan demand uh, and a lot to do with the fact that uh, even things like um, overdraft fees have have gone down. So net non-interest income is declining down. It's just sort of a, you know, it's reflecting the overall e economy here. It's a weird economy in the U.S. right now. It's not a growth economy. And yet we we benefit from very low unemployment, which is untypical of a weak economy. Uh, but inflation has been killer here. And um, so it's it's kind of a, a cloudy situation. Um, and from an innovation perspective, I, I can definitely tell there are a lot of banks kind of pumping the brakes. Um, I do a report every year here, Emmanuel, called What's Going On in Banking. Uh, it's uh, published the ninth edition of it just a few weeks ago. Uh, I survey between 300 and 400 senior executives at banks and credit unions. Uh, I have to admit that they tend to be more of the mid-sized institutions, not the J.P. Morgan Chases and uh, Bank of America. If you if you know Jamie Dimon and Brian Moynihan and can get them to fill out my survey for them the, for me, that would be great. Uh, but, uh, you know, it sort of re reflects sort of the on the ground banks, you know, the everyday Main Street banks, not the Wall Street banks. 
And you know, one thing that has uh, you know really popped out this year, number one, cost of funds is an absolutely top concern among bankers today. You know, not even talking innovation here or technology, talking economy, cost of funds is just at the top of the list. And number one priority is cost reduction, cost containment, and efficiency. And that tends to depress innovation spending. Uh, interestingly, it never seems to hit uh, I, overall IT technology spend. I think we're in a situation where banks simply cannot reduce technology spend. They have to keep spending it to, to keep uh, you know keep the wheels going. Um, and then the other thing I would throw out there as as a as a huge concern. Uh, you know, I ask every year, you know, who do you see as the top threats to the banking industry? And this year was a little bit different and interesting. It's big tech, big banks, and fin large fintech. Large fintechs like uh, PayPal or Square uh, have always been at the top of the list. But this year, an even higher percentage of executives said that they see all of these types of firms as threats, as significant threats. This time, Emmanuel, for the first year, I asked, to what extent do you see the U.S. government as a significant threat to the banking industry? And uh, about four out of 10 bank CEOs said they saw the government. So it's it's the regulatory environment that's really kind of popping in as a threat to the, the banking industry as it's it's clearly, uh, I mean, the administration, the, a lot of senators, it's clearly very negative from a regulatory perspective towards banks. You know, we've got the Credit Card Competition Act sitting out there that's going to slash interchange rates and, and income. You, uh, you've got an environment that is uh, not very friendly towards a lot of large mergers. I'm sure everybody's heard about the recent intentions of Capital One to acquire Discover. And... Uh, I think most people think that will not pass regulatory muster, although I think it might go with some conditions. Uh, but clearly they are trying to engineer a more, quote, competitive environment. And I think most bankers look at it and go, man, it's pretty damn competitive already. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Uh, so I'll I'll stop and let you kind of respond because, uh, I mean, clearly there's just so much going on here. Yeah. You know, Ron, as you were speaking, like the regulatory um you know, environment uh, that you described sounds very much like that in um, a lot of the more developed Asian uh, European countries. Uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also hearing the OCC starting to become very vocal and uh, vociferous in terms of uh, putting out uh, what they deem to be guidelines, uh, which sit over and on top, um, you know, what the FDIC does. So then you start to wonder, like, you know, who's who's overstepping whose jurisdiction? Uh, and essentially what they're saying to the U.S. banks is that, uh, you know, be careful of which IT company that you work with. Uh, you know, we hold you uh, wholly responsible, uh, you know, if you have downtime uh, and all of that. So uh, it, it's interesting that they become uh, a lot more uh, vociferous. They, 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 you know, they are making their demands uh, known clearly. Uh, which they weren't doing before. I think the, the environment in the U.S. was more like uh, let the innovations go on and then we'll, we'll pull the brakes when, when something bad happens. But now it's like uh, watch your steps, guys. Uh, if, you, you know, if you make a mistake, we hold you account accountable to, that, to, your, to, to do that. How would you describe the relationship between banks and their fintech so-called partners? Um, you know, I see a little bit of... Uh, onboarding relationships, um, you know, uh, with the fintechs. Uh, the fintechs decided that they didn't want to hold balance sheets, so they uh, they started to become originators. Uh, there are a number of those. But uh, on, on a whole, how would you describe it? Well, I'm going to push back on you a little and say we can't describe it as a whole because that would be mischaracterizing certain segments. You know, the term partnership, I actually wrote about this a few months ago, um, and, and I predicted that by the end of the decade, bank fintech partnerships will be a thing of the past. And I'm sure that that, you know, got a lot of people thinking, uh, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I get that a lot. You know, I get that a lot at home, Emmanuel. I got a wife and three daughters. So I'm kind of used to being told that everything and you've I do got is my love is wrong. <laughs> That's why I like you. Know, you. Keep uh, going. <laughs> I, I, I must be wrong. But, uh, you know, the term bank fintech partnerships, 
um, has kind of been described from a the banking as a service embedded finance perspective. You know, the, the banks who support fintechs. But the partnership or the interaction between banks and fintechs go a, a lot beyond that. There are a lot of community banks these days who are making investments. I actually wrote about this too. I called banks the new VCs. Uh, you know, there's a good percentage of community banks who are investing in fintechs, but they're investing in not the chimes and the Robin Hoods that compete with them. They're investing in the fintechs who are creating capabilities to support uh, and improve banks. So they're, but those those fintechs, Manuel, are really just going down the path of becoming new vendors, just like an, an FIS, a Fiserv, or a Jack Henry, or you know any any other vendor. So it, it's a weird kind of you, you gotta you can't uh, generalize the fintech community into just competitors like Chime and, and Robinhood, or or just you know even the PayPal and Squares who. I definitely think are competitive and there's no question about it. Uh, but there's an incredible large number of fintechs who uh, I and I call them enterprise fintechs or B2B fintechs because they they don't go direct to consumers, but you know, they may have consumer products and services. And so a lot of banks recognize that their own business uh, product development capabilities are pretty poor. Uh, they see very slow integration and development times from some of their core vendors and even their digital platform vendors. And so they're looking to fintechs to partner with them, but it really is more of a vendor relationship. Uh, I think in many cases, it's not a shared risk, shared reward type environment where there's you know revenue share, although there there are certain examples of that. Uh, so it's it's a that's why I say you can't kind of characterize this relationship. Um, while a lot of bankers here absolutely see the big tech firms like Amazon, Apple, and Google as threats and competitors, um, you know, I would venture to guess most banks would say, yeah, I don't see a lot of my business going off to any of these, any of these firms, right. you know, and um, so, you know, like, let's take Apple, for example, with Goldman Sachs, you know, Goldman Sachs is basically trying to get out of that relationship. And I think they basically have for the most part or have an agreement with Apple that they're going to get out of it. And it's not because Apple is a failure by any stretch of the imagination in the financial services world. Uh, I've been tracking this for a few years now. I've been tracking uh, because Apple up until recently has never uh, um, reported the number of cardholders they have. So I've done surveys. <clears throat> the last time was about two years ago, I guess, at this point, and I estimated they were at about six million. The funny thing is, is I did a survey last year and found that it, it had doubled. And I have to tell you, my first reaction was, um, I'm not confident in the data. Uh, and so I didn't publish anything. And sure enough, they just came out and said, yeah, it's about 12 million cardholders. So that's not a bad number, you know, from a perspective of just being in the market for a few years. Problem is they've attracted mostly a lower to middle income um, consumer and, you know, have, I think, you know, slightly higher than the industry average uh, loss ratios and, and delinquencies. And, you know, if you're the bank behind this, that's, you know, and if you're Goldman Sachs in particular, you don't want, that's not the portfolio you wanted. And uh, I don't know what Goldman Sachs was thinking getting into this in the first place. I don't know if they thought, you know, Apple was going to attract millionaires or something that would then ultimately become Goldman Sachs customers. Um, but that was, if that was the thinking, that was crazy thinking in the first place. But, um, you know, I, I think Apple could probably find another partner. Um, and this is the, the funny thing about the whole fintech world, Emmanuel, is that because of the regulations here in the U.S., that requires a licensed bank to be in the equation, the growth of the fintechs represents growth opportunities for, for banks. Uh, but you go back to the OCC who has been, you know, just relentless about hammering a lot of the banks who are providing the banking as a service capabilities. You know, there was an order recently against Lineage Bank and you know, I think some of the smaller institutions who are providing these banking as a service services um, you know, are going to get hit pretty hard because of the, the, the regulatory weight that they're going to have to put behind things. So 
I, I think what that's going to do is cause a consolidation in the banking as a service space. And I, one of my predictions for 2024 was that a a, a large-ish bank, you know, it doesn't have to be a J.P. Morgan Chase or Bank of America, but even you know, a large regional like a PNC or a U.S. Bank or even a Synovus will acquire um, a a, ba a smaller Bass Bank because um, they want to get into that business, and there's no point in building building it from scratch when you can you know, acquire a Bass Bank and then just throw a ton of technology and, and compliance resources at it. So I think we're going to see a lot of consolidation in that space. I'm still very bullish that there's a huge opportunity opportunity there because the demand and, and, and opportunity is as fintechs continue to grow and need these services. Of course, you know, a, a, reg, a, a major change in the regulatory environment could wipe out that opportunity in a second, but I don't see that happening. In fact, it's really just the opposite is it's getting tighter. And um, I think this this reflects, and I think this is important for your listeners, your readers, Emmanuel, to understand the US environment right now is, you know, it's, you, you got a government that says, oh, we want more competition in banking. But what they really want is less competition in banking. And I think there's an environment in DC right now where they're actually saying one thing and doing the opposite. And what they really want is, you know, ten trillion dollar banks so that they can eat more easily regulate them versus having thousands of small community banks. And uh, you know, unfortunately for a lot of these regulators, and really I'm talking about the uh, you know the politicians. They get their money, you know, they get funding uh, and you know contributions from a lot of these banks. So it's, you know, you're it, it's it's a weird environment. But I I really think the regulatory threats, the regulatory environment is really weighing on a lot of uh, senior bankers' minds right now. Maybe more so than you know the technology changes that are happening. But uh, you know we should talk about some of that too because I you know I think that's a big part of kind of what the mindset here in the U.S. is. Well, a lot to unpack there. Just uh, just before we go on, um, that report, that survey that you do, if it is available to readers in general, or at least an executive summary, um, let's give the readers a, a, a link uh, to that. Um, you know, in 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 the description below. Um, that's and, a free download. That's that's a, you know, nobody has to. Uh, okay. I think my I think so, my marketing department wants people to register for it. Okay, so, that's fine. Uh, that would be pretty so, cool, so, but. Uh, Give us the URL and then, you know, people can download that because, um, you know, our readers are definitely interested. Um, this, there's, there's so much to unpack. Uh, first question there is, um, what do you think, why, why do you think there is a, what do you think the sentiment is against, uh, for or against consolidation or mergers and acquisitions uh, in the U.S.? Why is there pushback uh, between uh, Discover and um um, who was that again? You said um, Capital One. Uh, Capital One wanting to buy Discover, right? So, um, you know, what's, you know, the pendulum always swings, um, you know, from left to right in the US uh, when it comes to sentiments to consolidation. So, where is that right now? Uh, well, the, the the pendulum is is way to the, uh, excuse me, way to the anti uh, merger because uh, there's a, a sentiment and it, and it really boils down to, I think, a, uh, you know, a few powerful senators in the U.S. who just kind of, number one, I don't really think that they really quite get the difference between Main Street banks and Wall Street banks and, you know, big banks. Uh, and so they're, they're anti, you know, the, the, the super large banks and, you know, have said many times they'd like to break up Chase or break up Bank of America, uh, which would accomplish absolutely nothing. Uh, and actually, um it would actually hurt. Look, big companies need big banks. Um, you, you know, if you're an IBM, General Motors, you, you need a big bank. Um, you, you you don't want to deal with 100 small banks. So there's a reason why large banks exist here, because they have a customer base that they serve. <clears throat> um, but then we get into a lot of politics. You know, the Credit Card Competition Act, which would further limit uh, the amount of interchange and, and actually force um uh banks and the, and the networks to uh provide additional choices 
this is actually one of the big drivers of the of the merger. Uh, Capital One, Super Sharp, you know, they see the Pulse network that Discover has, and that's what they really want. I don't really think that they 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 want the um, Discover credit card portfolio. It would be nice. It's actually well, it'd be nice for them. It would bring a kind of a whole new set of customers because Capital One tends to focus on a bit different set of you know credit risks than Discover does. But what they really want is the network. Uh, you know, their credit Capital One is not just a credit card provider. They are a bank. They have acquired banks over the past yeah. 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and so they do a fair amount of debit card volume. And if they can get the Pulse network, they can significantly reduce their processing costs. And so, you know, you look at it from a regulatory perspective. And, you know, here is the... Um, yeah, you know, the the government saying we want more competition with Mastercard and Visa. Well, Capital One is now saying, "Great, you know what? We'll pick up Pulse. We'll, you know, we'll we'll help grow that and create more competition." But then on the other side, the combination of Capital One and Discover would would combine to create the largest credit card portfolio, greater than Chase, greater than Wells and, and Bank of America. Uh, mm -hmm. So they see that as a negative. <clears throat> so that's why I think there's, you know, this, the, the, the Capital One is super sharp. I mean, you know, there's no, you know, they know, they know what they're doing. They certainly know that there's the regulatory risk, but they're putting the uh, regulators backs up against the wall saying, you want more competition? Great, we'll give it to you. And I would not be surprised if there was a, as a condition of the merger that Capital One had to divest the Discover credit card portfolio which uh, would, would be a nice thing for Capital One to have, but I think they might be willing to give it up to get the network. How's uh, faster pay coming, uh, Fed now, sorry, coming along uh, in the US? Uh, you know, I already know from um, all of the instant pay uh, initiatives of regulators in other markets, the UK, Australia, Singapore, um, you know, every country, the banks push back on the initiative. They, they are not about to give away their float. Uh, you know, they try and drag it out as long as possible until it becomes ubiquitous and, you know, every customer has that access and then, and then it becomes, uh, you know, that you, can't, you cannot be a bank without providing instant pay. Uh, but from the time that, um, you know, FedNow was initiated, uh, there was pushback. Uh, where are the banks right now and where do you see it going? All right. So we now have the, the capability. The FedNow launched last summer uh, capability. And it was it was really kind of funny. You know, it came out and, you know, you had the, the folks in the Federal Reserve posting on LinkedIn. Wow, this is you know, this is the most amazing accomplishment we've had. It's like, uh, hey guys, we had, we've had, we had faster payments here for the past six years, thanks to the clearinghouse. Problem is clearinghouse is pretty much owned and run by the large banks. So a lot of mid-sized banks don't want to participate in that. So they waited for FedNow to come out. Um, if, you know, the I, I was on a webinar a couple months ago, not even that long ago, with somebody from FedNow, from the Federal Reserve and, you know, he was saying, oh, this is great. And oh, yeah, you know, the volumes have been a little slow, but it'll pick up and it'll get there. And I was like, well, let's 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 unpack that one a little bit. Um, come on. It, if it was such a great uh, accomplishment, why isn't the volume there? We, we, we've got a, a, a problem in 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 the U.S. with faster payments, Emmanuel, and, and it's the, 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 it's not an easy problem to describe. I think it has at least two facets to it. The first facet is that, you know, there's a, a send component and a receive component. And financial institutions have basically launched federal uh, Fed now faster payments, only turning on receive, not send. So uh, I have to give credit. I forget who who told me this, but it, this was not an original thought. None of my thoughts are really original. I'm stealing from everybody. Is that uh, it's kind of like everybody has a mailbox, but nobody's sending mail. Okay. Um, and, you know, so that's one aspect to it. The second aspect, uh, and I've, if your readers and listeners want to hear more about this too, I actually wrote about this more recently, the, the, B2B, um, the B2B faster payment opportunity. It is not simply about, okay, we flip a switch and we now have faster payments and everybody starts routing their payments that way. 
uh, especially on the business to business side, you know, we're talking about integration with invoicing, integration with accounts receivable and payable. It's about, uh, you know, creating a solution around the faster payments capability. Uh, I know this is a hard kind of thing to get your arms around, but Fed, you know, Fed, the Fed now is a capability. It is not a solution. And there's a lot of work that I think banks have to do working with ERP providers, accounting providers, and so forth <clears throat> to kind of embed Fed now into those payment solutions, payment capable, you know, payment solutions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now, um, it isn't so much the float worried and concerned about; it's the um, the uh, wire transfer volume. Um, you know, we pay a ridiculous amount of money to send wire transfers here in the U.S. You know, could be thirty dollars up to you know hundreds of dollars to do that. And I think a lot of banks see that and think that you know an instant payment capability is going to cannibalize that that revenue. And reality is, is that yes, it will to a certain extent, but it doesn't mean that they have to give away the Fed now capability. There is still a, a willingness, especially on the part of businesses, you know, to pay for that capability if it's embedded into a, a broader solution. So we're just kind of slow in the evolution of this because uh, uh, number one, they're not turning on the send capability. And number two, they have not done the work to kind of build the solution around the technology capability, and I'm not even, and I'm, as I say that, I, I, and I, uh, I, I can picture one of my buddies who knows this space very well going, well, it's not a technology capability; it's just a set of specifications. Got it, got it, got it. So yeah, it's not really even a technology capability. Okay, I mean, someone's built a railway tracks, but no one's built the rail train stations and. Uh... Um, and, you know, and uh, the wagons to, to run on them. Just let's end off with uh, PayPal. They they are sort of um, you know facing some headwinds. Uh, where do you think that's coming from? Competition from everywhere. Uh, I think you know players like Square, Block, or whatever you want to call them, have uh, chipped away at some of their merchant base. Uh, I also think that you know, especially from just a pure U.S. perspective. You know, when I do surveys of U.S. consumers, Emmanuel, it is incredible what a high percentage of of Americans have a PayPal account and will send money through PayPal. But I think to a certain extent, you know, that growth has now reached, you know, limits. It, at some point, it's got to top off. And, you know, I think in general in the U.S., from a consumer payment perspective and even from a business payment perspective, uh, we have such a proliferation of options now that, you know, what was typically a, hey, no problem, I'll just PayPal you the money, has now a lot of different ways to kind of move that money. And I think that's kind of chipped away. Uh, I'll give you another thing, and I think it's just pure speculation. Uh, you know, PayPal about a year or so ago, you know, was was to, po, you know uh, talking about, oh yeah, we're going to become a super app, and we're going to do yes. this. I'm like, oh gosh, just, <laughs> I was you know, I was there at the office when they said that. Yeah, go on. Oh God. yeah, it, it's first of all, it, it it reflects a misunderstanding of what a super app is, and there is nobody who knows this better uh -huh. than you and your audience. We, we will not have super apps in the U.S. For a lot of reasons, and you are the reasons, of this yeah. For technology reasons, for industry structure reasons, for consumer attitude and behavior reasons, we will not have a super app here. But I think yeah. they got a little too caught up in this. Hey, we got to build out the thing, and I think they saw the, uh, you know, the the competition from Square, other players. Um, you know, you look at, I mean, they they got their their buy now, pay later business. I mean, I don't think people recognize that they've been in the buy now, pay later space probably longer than anybody else and had the dominant volume in position for a good number of years. But then along came a firm, along came uh, Klarna and just really chipped away. And Klarna in particular, I, I, I'm just a huge fan of. I actually wrote a post last year titled, Don't Call Klarna a Buy Now, Pay Later Company. They are an e-commerce enabler. Uh, they just launched a uh, an AI capability. Um, it, it's they've they're, it's a good company. They're doing a lot of stuff, and I think PayPal is just 
been a little slow to, to kind of keep up with, with the competition. <clears throat> um, and I'm hoping that a lot of people who who hear this, Emmanuel, are, are not from PayPal, so I don't get any nasty calls. Um, because yeah, they right. will get on my case for that. But uh, I, I think you know that's that that's the but long term. I mean, we're not talking about a company that's you know seeing any you know threats to their uh you know establishment. Yeah. It's you know, establishment. Yeah, it's just it's, yeah. These, it's it's speed bumps they're hitting just like everybody else is. Yeah, very nice, Ron, because um, I think what you're saying to me and, and my own understanding of the U.S. banking system is that, you know, the U.S. is pretty much a fully banked system. So any innovations that come on stream, they, they are chipping off at the sites, uh, you know, getting the, uh, you know, dredging the bottom of the barrel. Uh, so these are high risk, low income type customers. Um, and then and then after, after a point, uh, they give up and uh, you know they accrue back to the incumbents, uh, and then the incumbents themselves, um, you know, get eroded uh, on the sites like what PayPal is going through at the moment. Um, you know, so I think that sort of sums up um, a visual representation of uh, of the U.S. banking system uh, and what a mature banking system uh, looks like and how it plays out, uh, which will be very different from uh, you know a country which has you know, a billion people or something like that. Give me a drawdown on what you're, what's on your mind on AI. Okay, two two things. No, number one, uh, we have gotten to a point in the US where the use of the term AI is useless. Uh, it reflects a whole bunch of different technologies. And what's happened is prior to the release of, of ChatGPT, people use the term AI indiscriminately to refer to a whole bunch of different technologies. Then, uh, ChatGPT came out, popularized the term generative AI, and it flip-flopped. Then people started using the term generative AI as the as the generic term to reference a lot of uh, the whole AI thing, and that was wrong too. So okay. we got we we have to get to a point not just in the banking industry, but you know as business in a whole to stop using either AI or generative AI as the generic term. Number two, generative AI it re references a technology that's just going to change a lot of stuff. Um, and my prediction for 2024 for the banking industry in the U.S. is that the use of generative AI is going to be both overstated and understated, uh, meaning that you're going to have a lot of banks who are saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we're doing a lot with generative AI when what they're really using is conversational AI or machine learning or you know other stuff, but it's also going to be understated because a lot of senior executives in banks have absolutely no clue that their people are using ChatGPT to create and review uh, contracts, to create blogs, to create marketing content. To, you know, they, 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 use. <laughs> they, they have no clue what their people are doing with it. Because it's not an enterprise-wide tool. It's, it's you know, last year when I was giving presentations, Emmanuel, I, I kept saying, chat GPT is to 2023 <clears throat> what Lotus 123 was to 1983. It's a spread, it was like a spreadsheet. It was a personal productivity tool. And that's what a lot of these generative AI tools are. They're personal productivity tools and it just means that you, you're not making huge investments. You've got people who are just, you know, paying ten dollars, twenty dollars a month to use these tools, <clears throat> and they don't show up on the line items, uh, you know, when when management's looking at IT spend. So that's why I say I think the use of generative AI is going to be both overstated and understated in banking in 2024. Just top of your mind, what should generative AI? And in fact, you know, we we can start dangling the phrase. Uh, Gen general AI, right? Um, artificial general intelligence, uh, which is where we're working towards. Uh, what does that mean uh, on on an institutional basis? What should that mean on an institutional basis? Should it mean like JP Morgan putting uh, all of their research data in one cauldron and and applying AI to it, uh, or should it be the other way around, which is uh, an institution, um, you know, harnessing all the information that's outside the institution uh, and and trying to uh, 
harness it for local, I mean, domestic, you know, for, for internal use, for specific use, um, generative use, such as credit review, for example. Um, you know, what's top of, of your mind on that? Uh, and I, I don't, I won't hold you against any idea because I think this is such a moving uh, topic. Uh, and what we think is institutional uh, will change uh, the moment, you know, uh, open AI changed the pricing structure, for example. So, so just give me your top of mind thought on that. It's, it's kind of the traditional IT challenge, which has always been centralization versus decentralization. You know, do we centralize everything and make people do something that which, you know, helps from a standardization and cost perspective, but might hurt from a speed and agility and flexibility perspective. And it's kind of no different here. I, I tend to believe that the decision around the use of these tools, you know, has to be both the, the, the challenges. I think you have to push the, the utilization and deployment of it down to the decentralized functions. But the reason that you'll hit a wall is because it's, you know, the, the, the old garbage in, garbage out, you know, garbage data in, garbage data out. Um, this is the problem that, you know, I think a lot of banks are going to find is that, you know, that it isn't a matter of getting people trained and using on the various tools. It's at some point, you know, the data that's it's being accessed is isn't isn't that not, it's not that it isn't good data, but that there's a there's a challenge of accessing the, the data that you need. So it's going to take centralized data management to imp improve the use of decentralized functional use of the tools. So it it's not going to be it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be easy. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was talking with one banker at a uh, fifty billion dollar bank uh, who runs their innovation group and. And he was saying that, you know, they were what they they were they knew it wasn't really going to happen. But they said, you know, we wanted to go to the executive suite and go, we want to ban emails for three months, <laughs> internal emails, so that they could figure out a way to, you know, better tag data within emails, because that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. It's not like we're talking, like you say, about research data. That stuff, you know, the quantitative data stuff is relatively easy to categorize, capture, store, but it's really more about the the, 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 the softer stuff, the qualitative stuff. You want to tag that. What policies, what decisions, what did we do? How did it turn out? These are not things that are normally stored in databases, but can be gleaned from looking at communications and more qualitative stuff. And this is you know, where the big opportunity is, you know, especially from a, you know, customer support, customer interaction, analytic perspective, um, you know, the, the tool, the capability of the tools are absolutely amazing. You know, you've had tech vendors, Emmanuel, for who have wrestled with expense categorization for 10, 15 years. And one of my buddies who actually came from one of the PFM companies posted on LinkedIn a few weeks ago, he just threw the data into chat GPT and boom, it perfectly categorized all his spending and the trending and all of that kind of stuff is like, he's like, holy yeah. shit, I, I spent 15 years working on this and this stuff did it immediately. It was like that, you know, it, it's, it, you got to push the, the utilization of it down to the functions, but you, you've got to do something in terms of the, the, the data side of it. And that's why Emmanuel, I am adamant that we are not going to see job losses because of generative AI for at least 10 years until the you know the data has improved to the point where we can go, all right, good. Now we can finally start cutting back on on the people side of it. But you know these these reports that eighty percent of jobs are going to be replaced. Well, maybe, but it's probably going to take forty years for that to happen. Yeah, in fact, um, I, I test this idea with uh, core banking vendors that uh, one of the biggest problems they have is siloed um, databases. Uh, and I said, well, I think that um, you know, generative AI uh, solves your problem for you. It's gone. You know, like you, you don't have to worry about silos anymore. You can have as many silos as you want. Um, you know, and AI will go out and pick pick them up and 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 use them. And then they all go silent. They, yeah. you know, they they refuse to answer this question. Like, uh, you know, because uh, half of their income comes from maintenance budgets and uh, and improve and incremental improvements and stuff like that. So. Um, so I'm, I'm taking the silence as it, it is taking me somewhere, but um, you know nothing is conclusive just as now, just for now. 
um, you know, yeah. Uh, companies that you like, companies or banks that you like that are doing interesting things on AI? Uh, interestingly, I and I think people find it's like, it's not the big names necessarily, uh, but there's a few that I think are just doing really knockout job on stuff. South State Bank uh, just continues to, to you know, do testing on a lot of different areas uh, using, um, build. they've actually built their own large language model. Uh, the guy that I know that, who runs that group is now talking about large action models, not just large language models. Uh, they have been on the forefront of this. Got to give Chris Nichols and, and South State Bank a lot of credit for what they've been doing. Um, and then I'd actually point to some credit unions who are really doing some interesting stuff. Michigan, you know, of, of all players, you know, it's not even like the, the Navy Federals and the, you know, uh, the, the super large ones, but um, uh, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union has been incredibly aggressive about just their use of technology in general. April Clovis, uh, who's the CEO there, very forward thinking. Um, ben Maxim, who's their chief innovation officer and now runs their QSO. But he's actually all over the world, too. I'm surprised you're not at, uh, as we speak, at, at Finnovate Europe, which is where he's at speaking. So they they have been very aggressive in their use of technology in general. Um, and, you know, I think one of the areas that they have really succeeded is with their chat bot and really building out tools. Now, you know, I I will get a lot of times, you know, pushback. Oh, people hate using chat bots. Yeah, well, not younger people. And look who the Michigan State University credit union uh, member base is going to be very heavily skewed towards is younger folks. So you, right. you really got to look at your, your customer or member base and say, you know, but you know, last point I'm going to throw out there, Emmanuel, is that for a lot of banks where they're really short sighted about the use of some of these tools, especially chatbots, is that it is as much about a help of improving internal uh, productivity as it is putting it in front of the uh, customer or member base. So a couple, couple of financial institutions here in the U.S. making good use of these technologies. Right. Brilliant. Uh, Ron, uh, I, I just want to tell our viewers who joined in at the AI part of this conversation that this is part of a longer conversation. Uh, I checked with Ron uh, on the field of the ground in the U.S., uh, what the banks are up to, what the um, innovators, the fintechs are up to. Uh, and we had a longer conversation and then we got into the AI conversation. So thank you very much, uh, Ron, uh, and let's uh, continue this conversation, um, you know, and, and draw from each other. And, you know, and, and at some point I, I will also share with you what uh, banks in other parts of the world, I mean, like uh, there's this bank in China called WeBank, uh, which uses AI to do credit profiling. Um, and, and it's also very interesting, but anyway, that's for another day. Um, you know, so I'm very happy to draw from you, uh, uh, you know, and plug into you, um, your, your sense of what's going on in the U S. Uh, so this is a con continuing conversation, uh, catch up with you again, uh, in a month or so. Manuel sounds great. Thanks a lot for having me on.